All right, it's a monumentous moment because we're going to begin our first physiological system. And we're going to begin with the integumentary system. That's I-N-T-E-G-U-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. So the integumentary system. The integumentary system consists of the integument, which you will know better as the skin, body hair, nails, and then cutaneous glands. Okay, so the skin, body hair, nails, and then cutaneous glands, glands that are captured up in the layers of the integumentary system. Right, we're going to start out with the skin, and we're going to start out with some anatomy. And this is not just simply, oh, I want to do skin anatomy first. This is actually a very purpose, uh, very purpose order of events. Because the anatomy, the way things look, are going to define how those things function. So we're going to start with anatomy most frequently as we discuss different physiological systems. And we'll work our way towards the physiology, laying that over the anatomy that we've learned. All right, so skin anatomy. We're going to have two layers. In, in some cases, you can kind of consider it to be <coughs> three different layers. One of the layers, however, is not really a true part of the integumentary system. So the true two layers of the integumentary system are going to be the epidermis, which is going to be your very top layer of tissue. And you can see that here in this figure. And then just below that, with all of this stuff going on in here. It looks like the epidermis barked and that's where everything is now and that's going to be the dermis. So we're going to have the epidermis and the dermis. And as you can see there's a lot of stuff that's going on in both of these layers. Uh, just below the dermis, we have a layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue or subcutaneous fat. And that's frequently referred to as the hypodermis. The epidermis sits over the dermis. The hypodermis sits below the dermis, and hence the terminology that we're using here. So hypodermis is below the dermis. And we typically include this into the skin. But in all reality, it's not really a true part. It's not really a true part of the, the skin. In, in most cases, the epidermis is basically a connection between the integumentary system, the skin, and what's, what's below it, muscles, things like that. Now we'll come back and we're actually going to dissect what's going on here in the epidermis. If you kind of looked ahead, you'll recognize that the epidermis consists of five different layers. And we're actually going to go and blow that up and take a look at those five layers. And then the dermis has a bunch of other stuff that's going on in there. And we'll begin to parse that out as well. Uh, so before we can do that, or before we do that, I want to talk about two different designators, thick skin versus thin skin. Now the way that you can differentiate between thick skin and thin skin on your own bodies is you can look and try to find the hair or hairiness. If we lack hair, it's typically going to be the thick skin. If it's hairy, it's going to typically be the thin skin. And the reason that is, is because the thick skin, it has only really sweat glands that are present.
So thick skin is just simply going to be sweat glands. And so you can see here that we don't have <coughs> a lot of the other stuff that's packed into the dermis and permeates through the epidermis. There's no hair follicles or glands associated with that hair follicle or sense, sensory uh, uh, nerve endings or anything like that in our thick skin, or at least very low concentration or very low numbers of these items. Whereas thin skin, <coughs> consists of hair follicles and sebaceous glands. So in addition to the sweat glands, there's also going to be hair follicles and sebaceous glands. Now, typically, uh, we have a larger number of or a higher concentration of tactile uh, sensory organs and nerve endings. Uh, it's a lot of times more vascular, so a higher amount of blood vessels here. And then obviously the presence of hair. Um, thick skin, places like the bottom of your feet, your back is uh, mostly non hairy for most of us unless you have some Sasquatch genetics. <laughs> um, and, and think about it, you know, you get a cut on your hand, you usually feel it pretty good, but your foot, it's actually not as bad. If you jab yourself with a, I don't know, a stick in the hand, it hurts pretty good, and then the foot, it hurts, but not as, as much, and that's because of the difference in the uh, the makeup of those two different types of skin. All right, so this area called the epidermis. Uh, there are five layers that make up the epidermis. And each layer has basically its own type of cell. Actually, let's take a step back. Let's deal with the five layers first, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about those cells. Um, so here's a picture of the epidermis. The terms that you need to know here are things like strata, which means layer. If you know any geology and you go out and you look at layers of the rock, the geologist doesn't call them layers. They've got to be all fancy and they call them strata or strata. So the layers of the epidermis are going to be strata. And we basically go from the top towards the bottom and increase in the amount of living function or physiological function that's present. So the very top layer crowning the whole thing, stratum corneum, meaning the crowning layer. And these are actually going to be dead cells containing a molecule known as keratin. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit uh, later. And these constantly are flaking off or sloughing off. Uh, you have a loofah at home and you go and wash with your loofah and you're exfoliating and you're wiping away part, portions of this top layer of the stratum corneum. The next layer down is actually going to be living versions of these dead cells. This is the stratum lucindum, and it's named because it's a pretty clear layer, so it's lucid or lucindum. And then we add in some granular, uh, some granular um, uh, pigments inside of uh, the next layer of cells, and we get the stratum granulosum. And then we have the stratum spinosum. And then finally, the very bottom layer that connects up with that connects up with the, um, the dermis is going to be the strata basale, okay, basically the basement of the epidermis. Okay, so keyword there is stratum, and then just simply adding in descriptive terms as we make our way through these different layers.
All right, this epidermis is going to consist of five. <laughs> We're going to have Groundhog Day here in a minute. So we can talk about five layers again. It's going to consist of five cell types. Okay, so epidermis contains five cell types, and those five cell types, we're going to have stem <laughs> cells, and these are going to be cells that undergo a high rate of division, so these are going to be dividing cells. They are going to be located in the stratum basale, And as they divide and differentiate, they make their way up. So here's our stratum basale. These are our stem cells. They go through division, and they begin to move their way up the ladder. And so they become keratinocytes. Keratinocytes. Uh, the division is occurring by mitosis, so we're always duplicating our DNA and then splitting it again. Um, keratinocytes, by the way, you may see a word in there, keratin, and this is basically a, um, a structure that helps to, or I'm sorry, a molecule that helps to give additional structure and support to the uh, tissue. And so we begin to accumulate keratin as we become a keratin keratinocyte and make our way through this progression. The next type of cell, by the way, stem cells, they're not embryonic stem cells. They're tissue-specific stem cells. But the term stem cell just references a cell that has the ability to differentiate into, a different, uh, into additional cells. Embryonic stem cells would just be able to differentiate into a large number of cells from embryogenesis all the way up to adulthood, whereas these are going to be cells that will give rise to integumentary cells. The next cell type is the melanocyte. And the melanocyte, I'm going to refer to as the umbrella makers. And what I mean by that, uh, again, these are going to be located in or near stratum, the saline. What I mean by umbrella makers is they are going to produce pigments known as melanin. that can be released so we release these granular granular pigments known as melanin that are going to be picked up by the keratinocytes through a phagocytic process, so they're going to phagocytize the, keratino the, the, the keratinocytes are going to phagocytize the melanin and it will incorporate that melanin into the cell to umbrella or drape over the nucleus. So the nucleus is going to be draped in these granular, granules of melanin pigment. And what this allows to have happen is the nucleus, which contains all of our genetic material, on the sun side of the skin, where we have all of the UV light, we get this protective umbrella. And as that UV light comes down, which is ionizing radiation and can actually destroy the DNA, it's actually going to block that and help to prevent that ionizing radiation from having an effect on the DNA itself. Where's that last thing? Yeah. Draped in, yeah, draped or umbrellaed in granules. All right, so I've referenced the keratinocytes. We know that 
We have stem cells that become keratinocytes, and melanocytes are producing melanin that's going to be picked up by the keratinocytes. These are going to be the main cell of the epidermis. So the main cell of the epidermis that produce that molecule known as keratin that helps to provide structure. Number four are the tactile cells, and they form a structure known as a tactile disc. And these tactile discs have a protruding nerve. They actually um, are really more of a nervous type tissue rather than a epidermal type tissue, which the other tissue types here have been more epidermal. So we're going to have this nerve type tissue incorporated into this organ that we refer to as the integument or the skin. And it's going to help out with sensation. Okay, so you get touched or burned or whatever, you can actually pick up that information, send it to the central nervous system and process it. What is that? Form? It says form tactile disc with what? With a protruding nerve. The fourth or the fifth kind, fifth and last kind of cell is going to be a dendritic cell. This is actually a defense cell. And it is a star-shaped cell or a stellate cell, and it actually has immune function. So the dendritic cell is going to be incorporated into the epidermal tissue to allow for immune function, which makes a lot of sense, right, because this is basically our first barrier that deters entry into other physiological systems. These are going to be highly present in the stratum spinosum and the stratum granulosum. Okay, so skin is uh, very, I mean, everybody can see one of the few organs that you can see on your friend. And it's very up there, so to speak. Um, functionally, skin is a first line of defense for the immune system. It deters entry. Uh, skin is also a very important um, for coloration in humans. Not really as important as other organisms. Uh, although a lot of racism came out of skin color. But you look at um, other organisms, things like lizards and snakes, and I mean the chameleon is a classic example, can change its skin color to protect itself from predation. Uh, but in humans, skin color really not as uh, important. Not saying that it's important, not important, but skin color helps out with regulating basically the exposure that you experience from harmful ionizing radiation protects you from an immune perspective of uh, the skin does. So skin color is actually not really so much a idea of, oh, we have different types of skin, but oh, we have different levels of protection from the sun. Or level, different levels of protection from the external environment. So skin is going to be colored by the presence of melanin.
So skin color, melanin, is going to produce, be produced by the melanocytes, and it comes in two different flavors or two different versions. Eumelanin, which is a black colored pigment, so very dark colored pigment, and then pheomelanin, which is a dark yellow colored pigment. Okay, so a pigment with a dark yellow color. Now I take these two pigments in different concentration and you obviously can begin to see that I can get a wide array of different coloration. So dark skin, these melanin pigments are going to be produced in very large quantities. So production of large quantities of melanin. Further going to be enhanced because it's slower to break down in individuals with darker colored skin. And then the way that it's distributed or dispersed over the cell or over the nucleus is going to be very uh, very robust or very wide dispersion. So when you have large quantities of these darker molecules being produced, they're slower to break down, they get dispersed over a larger area, skin colors are going to be very, very dark. There is obviously also light colored skin. And light skin basically is going to be the polar opposite of the dark colors. So we're going to have lower quantities. Rather than being dispersed, we're going to have clumping over the nucleus. So distributed kind of just over the nucleus rather than over that whole side of the cell. And then we'll have enzymes present. I'm going to put that right over here just for simplicity's sake. And you probably should be expecting that, that it's going to be exposed to a higher rate of breakdown. Okay. And these are sort of the bookends, right? So real dark skin, you have that high level of dispersion, slower to break down, larger quantities, and then the really light colored skin, you're going to have lower quantities clumped over the nucleus over a smaller area, and then a much higher rate of breakdown. Yes? I guess I don't really know what you mean by exposed So the melanin itself are just going to have enzymes that break that pigment apart and dispose of it. And the enzymes are going to be more efficient, for lack of a better word, in individuals with lighter colored skin because they're going to be destroying or ripping apart those, those, cell types, or those, uh, those pigments. Okay? It really is amazing, I mean, because you think about this, and where we've come from historically, Cradle of man is right in the middle of the globe in high sun output. People needed to have large amounts of protection from the sun. And then as we moved away, we moved towards um, poles and things like that, the sun's angles changed. And so we've had these adaptations that have been basically present uh, from the very beginning once creation had, uh, had, had begun. And 
we don't need as much and actually higher rates of sun exposure, we're going to find out, becomes physiologically important. Sun is actually a very important physiological and environmental variable. Uh, and so if we have really, really dark skin from places like Norway, Finland, uh, northern Russia, even Canada, parts of the nor northern United States, there would be very dispersion physiology and a lot of physiological issues that uh, came in, in those people groups. It just is really crazy that, you know, given tree will and the destruction of mankind through sin, that we have things like racism based simply off of skin color. And we decided that we could dictate that because of someone's color of skin, we could determine their intellect, we could determine their, their, their worth. Yeah. So then, like, when you get a sunburn or whatever, a tan or whatever, you're not necessarily... Well, those are definitely two different okay, things. Okay, yeah, sorry. But, like, you're not changing the, like... Hold on. I don't know how it works. You're not necessarily, like, changing your pigment, like... Mm -hmm. You are. Okay. You're not changing the rate of melanin. I mean, yeah, not the rate of melanin. Yeah, you actually do. You, yeah. you, when you get a sun tan, you're causing more pigment to be cleared up over that nucleus. It's a response that says, oh man, I'm getting exposed to sun. I gotta protect myself. So more more pigment gets distributed over that nucleus to protect. And so you get a little bit darker because you have more pigment that's present. Is that the same thing that happens when you get a sunburn? So sunburn is actually quite a bit different. Sunburn, you're destroying the tissue and you have the response to injury. And a lot of the red that you see is because you cooked yourself. <laughs> uh, and so we get a little bit redder. There's also higher rates of blood flow. More hemoglobin towards the surface causes things to be a little bit more red because of the uh, trying to heal that, that, that tissue destruction. So after a sunburn, like you will peel and they get like tan, is that just a response of the Yeah, so the tanning is in response to, oh, I just had this really noxious stimuli, I better protect myself from it. The peeling is because you've killed all, killed all that tissue and it's just flaking away. Um, so melanin is like protecting, does that mean like your amount of melanin in your skin um, determines whether or not you're susceptible to getting skin cancer? That's actually a really good question. And I'm, I'm, I'm not really up on all the statistics on on uh, rates of skin cancer, but if I'm remembering correctly, skin cancer is actually higher in African American populations. It could it could be partially due to that. I, I don't know. Um, I don't really know what the <laughs> I'm most people, sunscreen and like, most people I know actually don't wear a lot of sunscreen. In fact, yeah. um, I used to growing. I mean, Minnesota is a very different place, and for for about six months out of the year, I mean, it, you'd say you know the longest day of the year, longest day of the year around here, the sun goes down at about like 5:30 and comes up right around 7:30 or 7:45. Back where I'm from. The sun is finally up at about nine o'clock, and it goes, starts going down before four. And by about four fifteen, it's darker than it is right now. Have a day. I know you don't have much of the day. Now go even further north and go to Alaska, where it doesn't ever come up if you're above the other circle. Ever. Well, I mean, eventually in the summertime it'll come up and it's up all for a long time, but during the winter time it never comes up. So. What? What do they do? They just go about normal business. They a lot flashlight. <laughs> but then in the summertime in places like Alaska and Minnesota, right now, um, the days are pretty equal in length. Up in Minnesota where I'm from, in around the summer solstice, you know, June and July, um, the sun will be up by about four thirty in the morning and it'll go it'll go down about ten thirty at night. And so the day's a lot longer. And so I was like, I hate sunscreen. And so I would just go out and I'd like burn like one time and then I'd just let it tan and I'd be like, yeah. And I never have to put sunscreen on. I'm probably going to pay for it. So and that's why I got to train you really well to be good nurses, especially oncology nurses, because I'm coming to you with skin cancer at some point in my life. But yeah, when, when you burn, I mean, it's so stupid not to wear sunscreen. Now, you don't have to slather on like the. 50 
SPF. SPF, like it's just like butter. There's like, yeah. You don't really need that, but you know something that's uh, like 20 or 30 SPF and putting it on a routine basis is gonna is gonna help out significantly. Although there are studies, this is I don't know we're totally taking a, a rabbit trail here, but there are studies that they've actually done where they've looked at the uh, populations of fish in places where the big Caribbean ships dock and let people out to go swimming in you know, little archipelago islands and things like that. And there's so much sunscreen that gets distributed into the water, which actually has estrogen-like compounds in it, that it's changing the reproductive cycles of the fish in those areas. Positively negative. <laughs> 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 All the male fish become a little bit more feminized, and that's not a good situation. <laughs> I don't want to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we have light skin and we have dark skin, and and everything in between. Right? We have the bookends of light and dark, and then every shade imaginable. There are a couple additional things that change or help to um, change skin color. You all, because you know, we've already said, oh yeah, I can get tan. Sunlight is going to, which is really UV light, it's the ultraviolet light that's permeating from the sun or radiating the sun that does this. The response of skin to UV light is to stimulate melanin production. But there are actually going to be some other factors. By the way, um, skin and skin health and everything and sunscreen and using it or not using it. You should use it, and then if you go to a tanning salon, just please stop doing that. <laughs> that is terrible for you. It really is. It's it just is awful. And the results, you can tell who goes to the who goes to the tanning salon because they, well, quite frankly, they look a little orange. Or they're already so tan and tan here that no one else is. Yeah, and it's just it's just it's kind of strange. <laughs> Do you do you remember? Do you are you talking about the lady who was having she was having her little kid like a four year old kid going she was having the little kid's hand as well and they interviewed her on the news and her skin she was like my age she was nasty she looked like a football <laughs> like the skin the skin was like. Like the composition of a football. <laughs> I don't have a problem. No, you have a problem. <laughs> like I just—that's the time that I wish that the newscasting news team would be would be would be totally biased and just be like, no, you look like a football. <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> Okay, there are a couple other factors that are going to differentiate skin color as well. Hemoglobin, which we find in the red blood cells, um, contain a lot of iron and actually give a reddish color, just like the Georgia red clay has iron in it, and so it's got a red color. Your hemoglobin contain iron and give a red color, heme, and so when you have blood flow near the surface, some of that red can come through, like maybe when you are embarrassed and you begin to flush red, it's because of the presence of those red blood, uh, or those red heme components of the hemoglobin circulating through the capillaries at the skin's surface. So obviously very present for a lot of people uh, during embarrassment, but there are also some people who you let, you know, they have more kind of a reddish tone to their skin, and that's probably coming from that blood circulating capillaries at the skin surface. 
Um, this is probably my favorite manipulator of skin color, uh, and that's carotene. Or beta carotene, and this typically comes from food consumption. And so things that you eat, you actually can begin to accumulate inside of the skin. It's picked up in the skin. Um, and carotene in particular is really good at this. It accumulates in the stratum corneum to generate a yellowish pigment. And the reason I like this so much is I had a roommate in college, and you're like, dude, your skin is really yellow. What's going on? And he's like, I don't know. He's sitting there drinking. And every day he drank, he drank a bottle of orange juice, which has carotene in it. And it was like this little jug. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> and he stopped drinking the orange juice for a week. And like started to turn less yellow. <laughs> he like, stopped drinking orange juice so much. <laughs> There are some other things that can change skin color. The pigment bilirubin, which is uh, babies a lot of times will have uh, high levels of bilirubin production because the livers have it. Um, totally uh, complete inflammation and they uh, also haven't begun to um, defecate as much as, what is that? Uh, it's uh, you, know, you want to take a break? No, I'm just saying, you told me the last time for selling your job. Thanks. <laughs> so, bilirubin, yeah, great example of embarrassment and hemoglobin flow through the capillaries at the surface of the skin. Thank you very much for that practical example, example Lewis. Beautiful. Bilirubin, it's a pigment that will build up in. Um, in the skin, and, and really it builds up in a lot of tissues. It's not a big deal when it's in the skin, you turn a little bit yellow, we call that jaundice, and you maybe have seen pictures of people or babies with jaundice, and the eyes, the whites of the eyes, they kind of turn a little yellow. That's not really that big of a deal where it becomes a real big deal is when it builds up in the brain, and you can end up having some neurological dysfunction and, and even development of uh, mental retardations uh, from high levels of really um, and, and babies usually get it. Um, in fact, it's really common in babies um, because the number one way to get rid of the bilirubin is through fecal production. And babies don't begin to really poop in high amounts until a couple of days old after they begin to use their um, digestive system that they can feed uh, on either formula or mother's milk. 